Our next speaker, Brother Jeff Litke, father of three daughters, Laura Liliana, and Macaria. He's a 2001 graduate of the program here, Spring Bible Institute. He's done preaching in New Mexico and Texas. He presently lives in the Woodlands. He's a member of the Spring Congregation. He preaches from time to time, even here in different congregations, and certainly works with us and brings lessons. He has a good mind on him and a very above average person in the preaching of the truth and ability. We appreciate him and we look forward to hearing this subject. Not that it's a pleasant one, but the truth of it needs to be brought out more and more in our society. And the topic that he will address is homosexuality. Brother Jeff. I use a timer. Last year I had my alarm set on my phone and went off in the middle of my lecture. I don't know if you all remember that. Eric saved the day and figured out how to turn it off. Last night I was sitting in the pew over here and there weren't very many people over here and this side was full. Your mind goes about the way it normally does in that situation. You start cracking the jokes to yourself about the sheep and the goats. Then you say, well, which side's the left and which one's the right? Start asking, is that from the speaker's perspective or the audience perspective? And certainly the people who are doing the announcements at Spring always have funny views on which is the left and which is the right and which is the back of the building and which one's the front. That's a, a constantly running joke. And it kind of makes you think, well, I wish we just called them port and starboard. Then we'd still have the confusion about what's the bow and what's the stern. So sometimes we don't know which way is up. In Jonah chapter 3, Jonah went through the city preaching and said in three days it will be overthrown. And the word used for overthrown there means turned over, turned upside down or right side up either way. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 6, people said about the preaching of the apostles that they that have turned the world upside down have come here. The truth is, they turn the world right side up. And the gospel has that power to take a world that's upside down, doesn't know which way is up, and to give it direction and turn it the right way. Certainly, we know that there is a lot of confusion in this world about the topic I've been assigned. Now, if I were being a good boy, I would do what I was supposed to do, and I would issue what I say is kind of like a standard disclaimer. Then we'd spend about 10 minutes talking about the love of God. And if you want to know about the love of God, go online, Google the love of God, and pick your Bible up, run the concordance. There are a lot of ways that you could hear those things about the love of God. I went searching on YouTube for, uh, in various internet places for sermons on homosexuality to sort of think about this and how it's being presented. And I found that a lot of them wasted about 10, 20 minutes discussing the love of God and didn't really ever get down to the topic that they were supposed to speak on. And I think that's useless for a couple of reasons. Not because the love of God is useless, not because it's not a good topic to speak on, but because when people come to hear a lesson on homosexuality and they hear you talk so long about that, they usually do one of a couple things, one of two things. They say, oh, that was novel. I can't believe how uh, kindly he presented that lesson when he didn't really get to, around to dealing with the lesson. Or they hear that and they check out. They say, oh, yep, that's right. God loves me. I can do whatever I want to. And so in either case, it really doesn't do a lot of good to waste a lot of time on that. But it's always good to think about your audience when you're presenting a lesson. And this one, there's a certain reason why it's important to think about that. There are a few different kinds of people who might hear a lesson like this. Those who agree for the right reasons. Okay, There are those people in the audience. There are those people who agree for the wrong reasons and they keep listening just because they want to feel right about themselves. Those people exist. In fact, the liberal media likes to present those people and say, see, this is what all Christians are. Now, I'm forced to think a little bit about this when I see terrorists beheading people because of their religious orientation. I'm said that that doesn't characterize the entirety of that religion. But if somebody says something stupid and some reporter's there to hear it, they say, see, all Christians are mean and hateful people. I just wonder how that works out. 
Sadly, I'm afraid I know why it works that way. There are those who enjoy being angry and uh, want to continue listening just to feed their need to be angry. You know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, uh, the militant homosexual. They just want to be angry. And those people are out there, and you know that they are. And then finally, there are those people who are genuinely concerned in a number of different ways. There are those people who are confused about the issue. There are those people who are confused about their own sexuality. And there are those people who are trying to be compassionate in their life and trying to understand the issue. Those are the honest people uh, and perhaps need the information that is in this lesson. So there's an important distinction to be made. And this is where a lot of times, this is why that's important in this lesson. When the preaching takes place, it needs to do several different things. And trying to cram all of those different things into one lesson is kind of walking a tightrope. It needs to deal with the homosexual agenda at large. You know, it's militant. It's out there. It needs to be dealt with. Second, preaching needs to deal with the individual homosexual activist. And then third, it needs to deal with the individual who may be a practicing homosexual, a struggling homosexual, or a person who's curious about such things. And so preaching on homosexuality has to do all of those different things and trying to put them all into one lesson uh, leads to a lot of confusion. Sometimes that's a willful misapprehension, but nonetheless it does. In a 2007 Barna poll, uh, uh, polled 16 to 29-year-olds, uh, said this, Today the most common perception is that present-day Christianity is anti-homosexual. Overall, 91% of young non-Christians and 80% of young churchgoers say this phrase describes Christianity. As the research probed this perception, non-Christians and Christians explained that beyond their recognition that Christians oppose homosexuality, they believe that Christians show excessive contempt and unloving attitudes towards gays and lesbians. One of the most frequent criticisms of young Christians was that they believe the church has made homosexuality a bigger sin than anything else. Moreover, they claim that the church has not helped them apply the biblical teaching on homosexuality to their friendships with gays and lesbians. First off, I already said that there was a lot of willful misapprehension. So you can account that for some of these numbers. Another thing is that a lot of times when this topic comes up, I've gotten the question, perhaps some of you have, is how come homosexuality is the worst sin? Well, I don't believe that. That pretty much answers that, doesn't it, David? Okay, so it's pretty much a non-issue. I don't believe that it's the worst sin. There are consequences peculiar to the progression of homosexuality in society that make it uh, a more immediate threat to living the faithful Christian life. And there are some reasons for that, and hopefully we'll get into some of them. One writer said this about uh, the reason that the, the poll results are the way they are and the way that the church is supposed to deal with it. He said the contemporary church has been so inundated with pro-homosexual literature and advocacy that it has in many cases lost both the ability to discern such disgraceful iniquity and the resolve to fight against it. So, facing militancy. I told you I went online and started looking for sermons on homosexuality, and I also told you that I found very, very few, if any, that could be characterized as hateful sermons. In fact, most of the guys bringing those lessons bent over backwards to try to do just the opposite of that. I think about that, and most of them have that God loves disclaimer at the beginning of it, and I think about how this idea that Christians, in a majority sense, are mean, hateful, spiteful people who just hate the individuals of homosexuality, of homo, uh, homosexuals and don't care about their souls, all that is much nonsense. Those people who say that and believe the, that are an anachronism. It's kind of like these uh, college English professors who are convinced that we're living in a repressed Victorian era. I don't understand how that works, but they are, and they think that it's their duty to liberate each and every one of their students. It might be good for them to read the newspaper a little bit, and those books that they read might be good, but bring your head out a little bit to see what's going on in the world. So this lesson is primarily going to address the third group, and I'm talking about the individual. And when I'm talking about the things going on in the homosexual agenda, it's intended to get them to think about how it is that they've been influenced personally by the things that are going on in the political agenda and political activism movement. So let's talk about, first off, some of the advances. 
In February, uh, on February the 9th of 1979, uh, 71, excuse me, uh, the first pro professing gay character appeared on network television, on the Archie Bunker program. I actually saw that episode before I was ever a Christian. I couldn't believe it. I was kind of surprised. It was kind of a strange program. Uh, but it happened in 1971. Since then, television and media has been flooded with gay characters designed to change the public's uh, perception of homosexuality. That's the design and purpose, uh, and they don't even hide that. So we've come a long way in the changes that have been made in society. I started looking for a timeline of uh, changes in the homosexual agenda and how that's progressed. Dove gave a good rundown of some of those things last night. I found this one from a website called, website called mybarackobama.com. This isn't a color printout, but you can see that those lines are rainbow on the original. And uh, I'm not going to go through all these, but June 17, 2009, uh, the administration ordered the federal government to extend key benefits to same-sex partners. June 29th of 09 hosted the first ever White House lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender pride reception. Uh, June 9th of 2010 allowed transgender Americans to receive true gender passports without surgery. Uh, December 21st led a United Nations measure to restore sexual orientation to the definition of human rights. I'm going to quit. I was going to read more of these, but... It's no secret that there have been changes in the public perception, in policy, in all of those things that homosexuality has made inroads into our culture uh, that is going to be difficult to displace. And so it is that there have been a lot of advances. How did it get so far? Now, let me first off say one of the ways that it got really far in changing our culture is science. Now, if you're listening to an audio-only version of this lesson, I want you to know that I did some pretty extreme character air quotes when I said science. And we're going to talk about why that is. But when science fails you, you have to turn to the other method of changing culture. And that is, say it loud and say it often. And that's the way that it works. There's a quote that's misattributed to Voltaire that said, anything too stupid to be said must be sung. The actual quote uh, came from Pierre Beaumarchais, and it says, that which is not worth speaking, they sing. Okay, that man himself was a foul character. Uh, but I like another quote by a guy named Andrew Fletcher, a Scottish political activist, who said, let me write the songs of a nation. I don't care who writes its laws. And that's the method that has been chosen by, by homosexual activism to change people's minds uh, where science has failed them in their agenda. There's a song by Lady Gaga said, I'm born this way. It says, I'm beautiful in my way because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track, baby, I was born this way. Don't hide yourself in regret, just love yourself and you're set. I'm on the right track, baby, I was born this way, born this way. Whether you're broke or evergreen, you're black, white, beige, chola, descent, you're Lebanese, you're orient. Whether life's disabilities left you outcast, bullied or teased, rejoice and love yourself today because, baby, you were born this way. No matter gay, straight, or bi, or lesbian, anyways, you get the idea of the song. You just sing it, put it to a catchy tune, and people will just change their minds about things. One writer talking about Andrew Fletcher's quote said this, Artists express the ethos, ethics, and pathos, passions of a culture without having to be academically precise. In other words, when this is your chosen method of changing people's views, the facts really don't matter that much to you. And so you can accomplish your purposes without worrying about uh, being accurate. Just say it loud and say it often. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of being born that way. In 1994, I wasn't a Christian. I saw a movie uh, not long after it was released, I guess about 1994, uh, a sordid film uh, by Oliver Stone. It was called Natural Born Killers. And the title, uh, the title of that movie stresses uh, the, the overtone of the whole episode that's a lot of times overlooked. The media picks up on this and commented on this, and they couple together uh, two things in the movies, two themes, uh, that the characters, the protagonist, grew up in an environment of violence, and then the media glorified that violence, and so they said that it was all about those pressures creating violence in our society. But there's another thing at work here that's different in the movie and the original play, and I want to look at a couple of those. And that is that the title is really the main idea, that they were natural-born killers. 
David, I took a little bit of artistic license because the original script had expletives in it, and so I changed those to common decent words. Now, I don't know if Hollywood will appreciate my artistic license, but uh, I'm going to call it artistic license because if not, then they'll get really mad. But the main character, Mickey Knox, was being interviewed by a guy named Wayne TV, and in the movie is kind of a Geraldo, old Geraldo kind of character. And he says, Mickey Knox, when did you first start thinking about killing? Mickey says, birth. I was thrown into a flaming pit of scum forgotten by God. And he laughed. What do you mean by that? Wayne asks. Mickey, what do I mean? I mean, I came from violence. It was in my blood. My dad had it, you know. Eat, sleep, kill, die. It was all my fate, my fate. Mickey states he found purity in part through killing. Wayne asked with Mike Wallace intensity, the script says that. Uh, all right, Mickey, let's cut to the chase. Let's get real. Why? Why this purity you feel about killing? Why? Why, Mickey? Mickey laughs. I guess, Wayne, you just got to hold that old shotgun in your hand and it all comes clear to you like it was for me that first time. That's when I knew my one true calling in life. Wayne asks, what's that, Mickey? Mickey smiles. He says, I'm a natural-born killer. He was just born that way. And that's the idea throughout the movie. There's another scene in the movie where there's a woman telling a story. About, it's an Indian woman telling a story uh, about another old Indian woman. And she talks about how this woman went out to collect firewood. She came upon a poisonous snake frozen in the snow. And she picks up the snake, she takes it home, she puts it in a warm blanket by the, by the fire, nurses it back to health, gives it some milk. One day she's working in her tent and uh, the snake jumps up and bites her on her cheek. And the woman says to the snake, says, why did you do that? I took care of you, I helped you. And the snake says, you idiot, you knew I was a snake. The idea of that story is to show that just like Mickey, uh, they're natural-born killers. They can't help who they are. And so that's the idea. The original script by Quentin Tarantino gives a little bit more succinct insight into this. Mickey says at one point about the first time that he held a gun, as soon as I held that baby in my hands, I knew what I was going to do. It felt so good. It felt like it was part of me. And then the climax of the original script, Mickey says, everybody thought I'd gone crazy. The cops, my mom, everybody. But you see, they all missed the point of the story. I wasn't crazy, but when I was holding the shotgun, it all became clear. I realized for the first time in my life, my one true calling in life, I'm a natural born killer. And so you could say this. You could say that Mickey's first murder was really a coming out that needs to be celebrated by uh, an oppressive society that's backwards in its thinking and can't accept him for who he is. This thinking is not new. It goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. There was a guy named Cesar Lombroso, and he's considered the, moder uh, the father of modern criminology. He was an Italian physician who performed hundreds of examinations on criminals during the late 19th century, and he noticed that a lot of these criminals uh, shared a lot of the same physical characteristics. And so he made a list of all these different characteristics, which included a receding hairline, forehead wrinkles, a bumpy face, broad noses, fleshy lips, sloping shoulders, long arms, I'm okay, pointy fingers. Lombroso associated these, uh, these stigmata with primitive man. And this condition was called activism. And its theological roots were embedded in one of the most influential books ever written. That's Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. And just let me say right here, Charles Darwin was a misogynist and a racist. Go and read it, and nobody should give any... Uh, attention to his writings. It's filth. But Lombroso became convinced that a criminal was an immoral person, a sort of throwback to primitive man who had not developed to the same biological level as the modern non-criminal man. Lombroso called this inferior being the born criminal, a being who was predestined for criminal behavior due to his physical disfiguration. Some people discounted his theories, some discounted his methods, some both. Uh, the, the idea was later popular, popularized in the medium of film, originally in a play and then later on in the movie, uh, The Bad Seed in 1956, where a girl uh, prematurely becomes uh, a murderer because of a genetic predisposition, bad genes that she had. And so this idea is out there. 
The popularity of genetic research came on and met the press uh, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, and they were a little bit more, more scientific, not to say that there's good science, uh, but they focused on some other things rather than just physical indicators. They were less deterministic uh, than earlier biological theories, uh, but they still had basically the same thing, is that there was something physical about these people that automatically made them criminals without regard to their own choices in life. And so that was the, the problem with these things. There's a lot of information about this. But studies in the interrelationship between criminal tendencies of parents and children have found that children whose parents are involved in crime are more likely to engage in criminal behavior than children whose parents were law-abiding. And this finding is surprising due to a number of sociological factors that influence the children. Studies of twins provide somewhat more persuasive evidence. Researchers have compared identical twins to fraternal twins who share no more genes than siblings who are not twins. In most studies of twins, the degree of consistency between the criminality of identical twins is approximately twice that of fraternal twins. Now let me just say here, have any of these people ever heard of control groups? I, I, I don't know. I learned that and Miss Marcourt taught it to us in fifth grade, so I know what they are, but I understand that when twins grow up in the same environment, then you can't discount nurture and say it's all nature. That's kind of a problem. That's not science. So anyways, genetics. In the mid-90s, a man named Simon LeVay uh, published some research basically under the battle cry of they're born that way. In his first significant published study that indicated a possible biological role for homosexuality uh, who was then uh, from Simon LeVay, who was then at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in San Diego, California in 1991, Dr. LeVay reported subtle, I think that's important, subtle differences between the brains of homosexual and heterosexual men. LeVay measured a particular region in the brain, the interstitial nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus, we call it INAH, because that's a lot easier to say, in postmortem tissue of three distinct groups, number one, women, Number two, men who were presumed to be heterosexual. Number three, homosexual men. The conclusions of LeVay's studies are problematic for a few different reasons. Number one, if somebody does an autopsy of a guy who has a hole in his head, that doesn't prove that he was born to be killed. Y you'll follow the thinking here? There's a few other problems with it, is that the variables in his data, again, control groups, the variables in his data, uh, the variables, rather, in the experiment render the data inconclusive. Nineteen of the homosexual subjects used in the study all had died of complications of acquired immune uh, deficiency syndrome, AIDS, right? AIDS has been shown to decrease testosterone levels, so it should be expected that those who suffered from that condition should have smaller INAH. In other words, when you contract an immune disease, it does strange things to the glands and parts of your body that regulate immunity and, and hormone processes. So you can't deduce anything from his, from his data about homosexuality alone. You can just say that these people had different things and we don't know what caused it. Another thing is that he himself stated very clearly that his data didn't prove that homosexuality was genetic. He says, it's important to stress what I didn't find. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way. The most common mistake people make in interpreting my work, uh, in interpreting my work nor did I locate a gay center in the brain, uh, as is sometimes quoted. Then the last blow to LeVay's credibility is the fact that he's extremely biased. He himself is a homosexual, and he himself admitted that when he started his research, he wouldn't accept anything other than saying that uh, homosexuals are born that way. He said it basically himself. Listen, being homosexual itself, it's no surprise that LeVay observed people who think that gays and lesbians are born that way are more likely to support gay rights. Did y'all catch that? In other words, I want the desired outcome from public perception, so I'm going to arrange the facts to produce that. It says... Uh, in a Newsweek article, he was quoted as saying, if I felt I didn't find any difference in hypothalamuses, I would give up scientific career altogether. That would have been a greater service to mankind if he had done that. But in the shadow of that propaganda machine, in the failings of that research, there was another thing going on, a 13-year study to 
uh, decode the human DNA. And the project goals of this human genome project, which was completed in 2003, are stated as this. Identify all the approximately 20,000 to 25,000 genes in human DNA, determine the sequence of the 3 billion chemical base pairs that make up human DNA, store this information in a database, improve tools for data analysis, transfer related technologies to the private sector, and then address ethical, legal, and social issues that may arise from the, from the project. Now, the homosexual community was super excited about this until 2003. You might say, if you weren't listening, you might say, well, what happened in 2003 that caused them not to be excited anymore? They published the results. You know what was conspicuously absent in those results? There's no gay gene. They mapped it, they did science, and they found out it does not exist. So we're back to singing and trying to convince society that people are born that way without any evidence. But, you know, we're a scientific community and we believe that science is important for all things. So there's no gay gene. Let's talk about the born gay irrationality. Governor Howard Dean in 2004 said this, the overwhelming evidence is that there is very significant, substantial genetic component to it. From a religious point of view, if God had thought homosexuality is a sin, he would not have created gay people. That's great logic, isn't it, David? That's awesome. Well, let's try this on for size. If, I, if God had thought lying was a sin, he wouldn't have created liars. I bet the Clinton administration would endorse that. If God had thought theft was a sin, he would not have created kleptomaniacs. If God had thought pedophilia was a sin, he would not have created pedophiles. I'm going to jump ahead of myself here a little bit just in case I don't get to it later on. There's an organization which is very active uh, in American politics and lobbyists up to Washington. They're headquartered in Mexico because it, they're not, it's not legal for them to exist in America yet. The North American Man-Boy Love Association, otherwise known as NAMBLA. And they believe that they should have the right to practice pedophilia uh, with young boys. And they argue against most gay activists who say they're born that way because they want it to be a choice. Because if they say that it can be a choice, then they can argue for consensual sexual relationships with minors. And see, they need that choice to get the consensual and to get the legislation arranged the way they want it so they can practice their own particular breed of perversion. This is coming. It's going to come. It's going to happen. They're going to move from Mexico and be up here uh, and be a legitimate organization, and this is going to be accepted in society. There's no way around it on a social level, but on a personal level, everybody ought to be guarded against it and try to influence their neighbors against those sort of things. But I want to know, when the person from NAMBLA is over there saying, I'm not born this way, it's a choice, I wonder if the homosexual activist is saying he was born to say that. I want to put them in a room and cook up some popcorn and see what happens. I think that it could be interesting. So back to the quote, if God had thought rape is a sin, he would not have created rapists. You can do a fill in the blank. If God had thought blank was a sin, he would not have created people. Well, people have traveled that road and tried to say just about everything, but here's an important passage from the Word of God which deals with that. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see, the correct proposition would be to realize what the assumptions and the knowns are in that proposition and then arrange your, your proposition accordingly. If God created people innately gay, he would not have unequivocally stated they were lost and could not be saved while remaining in that state. That's a true proposition. You all follow? We switch around the terms and deal with the ones that are assumed as assumed and deal with the ones that are known as known. And so that's pretty good logic. Whatever logic makes homosexuality good makes all manner of sins good. It opens the Pandora's box to everything. Pedophilia, bestiality, murder, rape, all of those different things. And suddenly Mickey Knox is a legitimized character and when he does that, we should celebrate his choices. That's the Pandora box that the homosexual activists would like to ignore. 
Sometimes we deal with these things and homosexuals will say, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to become uh, a pedophile or suddenly, instantly, we're not going to uh, you know, resort to bestiality or that's wrong, but what I'm doing is okay. They try to distinguish those things. And I couldn't help but thinking about this last night uh, during Brother Dub's lesson when he was talking about the rose and the roots. You know, you can pick a flower and it's going to be pretty for a few days. You can put it in water, it'll be pretty for a few more days. It doesn't have the roots, but eventually it's going to die. And here's what happens with all of these different perversions in society. And it goes back to like he was talking about uh, when no-fault divorce was accepted among the states. I'm sure that just like today, for instance, when marijuana was legalized, People got interviewed by the press the next day, and the first thing they said, it was, the sky didn't fall. The sky never falls in one day. Nobody's ever said that the sky is going to fall in one day. But you look around, here we are. There are a lot of things that aren't the way that people thought they would be when they legitimized that perverted behavior. You know, this is at least part of the reason that Huxley wrote Brave New World is to exercise caution. We don't know what the consequences of these conveniences and new ideals are going to bring. And so he was deemed not a team player by some of his progressive friends. But nonetheless, the sky doesn't fall in one day. I'm not saying that just because you decide that uh, you're going to practice homosexuality that someday you're going to turn up practicing bestiality. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that if you accept that in culture, your choices leading to others' acceptance, eventually it's going to come. And those people who promote homosexuality, they will be held responsible by God Almighty. Well, what is normal? Some people have sought to legitimize homosexuality by turning to the animal kingdom. And I've got a couple of articles here. I had dozens of them um, that, that talk about this sort of thing. But... Uh, there was a new exhibit in 2006, not new anymore, but it was new in 2006, uh, talking about birds and bees may be gay. A museum in, in Norway was open, pushing the idea that homosexuality, homosexuality is natural, and they had um, presentations on 1,500 animal species that they said demonstrated homosexual behavior. Well, there's another article here. They like the penguins. I don't know why they like the penguins so much, but apparently they're bent on making the penguins homosexuals. And I feel sorry for the penguins. I don't think that they should treat them that way, and they should have a voice, right? But uh, they found out where male penguins would couple up, and they said, see, they're gay. There was a different article, a different study from 2010, where uh, a pair of male penguins in captivity in a zoo started taking care of a penguin chick. Are little penguin babies called chicks? I don't know. We're going to call it a penguin chick. But they started taking care of it, and so they said, oh, isn't that wonderful? The penguins are gay. That doesn't prove anything. I'm going to select Eric, because I'm pretty sure nobody's going to accuse him of anything. But <laughs> if we were on a plane ride, and that plane crashed in the ocean, Eric me and some little child were the only ones that survived and we swam to a nearby desert island. You know what Eric and I would do? We'd take care of that kid and that wouldn't make us anything other than faithful Christians doing what we're supposed to do. But anyways, they decide that these penguins are gay because they decided to be kind to this little chick. And uh, the zoo officials said, well, we need to put them in an environment that's more like their natural environment. So they tried to move in female penguins. And, of course, the homosexuals were outraged and said, you can't do that. <laughs> and so the zoo moved out the female penguins. I don't know how exploring animals in captivity, I wonder what PETA says about this, if we should say that what animals do in captivity is an exhibition of their normal behavior. I think that PETA ought to get together with the homosexual movement and sort that out. But nonetheless, this is what happens. There are a lot of different, there, there's a lot of information about the penguins and why the conclusions are not so, but I'm just going to leave all of that science stuff aside on that and just ask one question. Maybe it's not even a question. I'm just going to make a statement. Praying mantises eat their young. What is normal? That's the question. So if homosexual behavior is normal, is it abnormal for a homosexual to desire relations with a person of the opposite sex? 
think that's a fair question. If homosexual uh, behavior is normal, then if a homosexual desires sexual relations with a person of the opposite sex, is that abnormal? Prior to 1973, homosexuality appeared in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, the official reference book used by the APA for diagnosing mental disorders, and they would say these people have problems and they need to be treated and changed in 1973. Keep that in mind. Come back to it. More evidence. Two guys, Bailey and Pillar, did a study, back to the twins again, on twins, and they examined 56 pairs of identical twins, 54 pairs of fraternal twins, 142 non-twin brothers of twins, and 57 pairs of adopted brothers. Their hypothesis, if homosexuality is an inherited trait, then more twin brothers would be expected to have the same orientation uh, than non-twin or non-biological brothers. However, they found that only 52 of identical twins of homosexual men were also homosexual. For some... This simple majority may be a success. Stop and think about it for a second. If gay people are born that way as a matter of genetics, then two individuals who share exactly the same genetic information, they have to have 100% concordance to make their case. The study on twins absolutely disproves the idea that homosexuals are born that way as a matter of genetics. So I kind of think that the APA needs to rush in and help these practicing bisexuals or these uh, twins who are simply confused and which one are they going to go for? That could be a, a serious problem. So I've drawn a conclusion by the evidence that David is up here that my time is drawing short. So there are a couple things that I want to get in, so I'm going to jump to those. There's a lot, there are a lot of victims of the push in the media to promote the homosexual agenda. And there are a lot of different reasons they're promoting that agenda, but I want to give you an anecdote that will maybe help us in understanding where the individuals fall in the crossfire fire of this war uh, against what God teaches. There's a guy named Pierce Brosnan. Some people know him as 007. He played the character, James Bond. And when he was younger, he decided that he was gay. Let me tell you the reason he decided he was gay. He liked to dress nice. He liked gourmet cooking. And he liked show tunes. And so all of his friends said, Pierce, you're gay. And so he had to decide whether or not he was. He wasn't anchored with the truth of God's words so that he could know that that was nonsense. But he was a victim. He later decided that he wasn't gay. But he was a victim of the push for the modern homosexual agenda. And there are a lot of people who are victims just like that today. The idea that you're born that way is influencing a lot of people. We've moved in our society from the statement of sexual preference to sexual orientation. One of the things that they say when you talk about this is, you know, it's sexual orientation. I didn't choose this. And say, well, when did you choose to be gay? Well, I didn't choose it. I was watching some documentaries uh, on alcoholics, and this one guy said, I always felt out of place. And finally, when I started drinking like my dad did, I finally felt comfortable in my own skin. And you think about that, and you think, how is that really any different from the struggle of a person who decides that he's homosexual? How is it any different? The things that make up you, who you are, some of those things are your character that you get just as the virtue of being who you are, and you can apply those to good things or bad things. There's some good quality about everything that you have that you're born with that you can apply towards the good and using God's service. There's another component to this is that your upbringing influences you in ways that we probably will never really be able to comprehend. And so that's the nurture. But nobody is born being gay. I can't deal with all of the biblical topic on this, but I do want to say this. Number one, that God is no respecter of persons. Number two, that God does condemn homosexuality in the Bible. Jude 7, that's Jude chapter 1 and verse 7, just in case you're curious, talks about even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. It wasn't enough to say fornication. They went after strange flesh. 
are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Thayer's talks about this strange flesh and says, one not of the same nature, form, class, or kind. Lou and Nita goes into a little bit more detail dealing with the entire phrase as an idiom and says, an idiom literally to go after strange flesh, to engage in unnatural sexual intercourse, to have homosexual intercourse. They committed homosexual intercourse like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Homosexuality is condemned in the Bible. It's condemned under the patriarchal dispensation in Genesis chapter 19. It was condemned under the law of Moses. By the way, I don't think that we should take them out and uh, uh, kill them, execute them. I don't know faithful Christians who really believe that. Uh, but Leviticus chapter 18 says that if a man lays with a man as with a woman, it's an abomination. I'm not under the law of Moses. It was nailed to the cross. But I know how God feels about that behavior. The same way he felt about it in the patriarchal dispensation when he rained down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And I know how he feels about it under the law of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, the law by which all of us are going to be judged. 1 Timothy 1, verse 10, 11 says, For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. That word whoremongers, Thayer again, divines, refers to one who engages in sex with a male as with a female. In the New Testament, we read about people who changed. And if you're practicing homosexual and hearing this lesson, you can change. And God will forgive your sins. You can live a normal life according to the design that God has set forth in His Word. People can change. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. And what do they stand to gain? The kingdom of God. Thank you. Well, I think I'd give that an A++. That was top notch. I learned a long time ago that Jeff had an analytical mind and that he thought systematically and logically. I always appreciate hearing him very much, especially on a lesson like this. <clears throat> One time a long time ago, I was visiting with a person who was saying they were born that way, defending their homosexuality. And I said, in other words, you had no choice. Because of your genetic makeup, you were born this way, and that's just what you do, like the snake biting the person. Yeah. I said, will you allow me to say the same thing regarding why I opposed homosexuality? I was born that way, and I can't help it. Well, of course they won't. But if it works for them, why wouldn't it work for me? It's obvious they know I'm opposed to it. So why am I opposed to it? Well, that's at your choice. Well, turn about fair play. You're where you are by choice, not by genetics. Or else you're going to have to admit, I'm opposed to you, and I can't help it because my genetics put me this way. So all of that stuff can be met uh, a lot of times just by the plain uh, logic and carrying it on out to its own conclusion. We appreciate it. We won't, though, as Jeff Will said, and I appreciate the way he closed it. Uh, we as the Lord's Church, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament of the Christ, we would have every homosexual... Be obedient from the heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There were some, as Jeff pointed out, who heard and believed and obeyed the gospel. And Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians. That's what we're all about. But at the same time, we must point out where these things lead. And the consequences of some sin are worse than others. As I've used often, a lie about me will send you to hell. Murdering me will send you to hell. But I'd a lot rather have you lie about me than murder me. And surely that sets out the consequences are different, at least with me in that case, in the sins that are committed. We need to understand that in analyzing even uh, sin and what it is. We thank you very much for being here. We have a, have a good group. And let's stand dismissed for about ten minutes. We'll come back in there for our next session.